Hello everyone and welcome to PC Retro Tech. If you've been watching the videos recently, you know that I've been going through two very large collections of PC parts that I purchased online. And in particular, I've been going through all the video cards. We started with the ISER and PCI ones. And this week I'm going to make a start on the AGP ones. And as you can see, there's really a lot of these cards. In fact, there are so many, it's doubtful that I get through them all in one video, especially if there's some really interesting ones in here. You remember I've been using my Pentium 3 machine for this uh, because it has an AGP slot and PCI slots. Uh, it's running at 1.45 GHz and it's really just an ideal machine for trying out cards from this era. So the first thing that I want to do is go through all of the cards and identify what they are. Many of them don't have stickers on them saying what they are and so I have to put them into the machine and boot the machine to see what they say about themselves. Before I get to that, I want to address quickly a viewer question from last week. Uh, we were looking at this S3 Verge DX card and I noticed that it wasn't running properly uh, with the Windows drivers and a viewer had a very good suggestion to try some S3 drivers. Now it turns out that I probably was doing that uh, when I actually went to a different driver version uh, I was actually using S3 drivers, I believe. Uh, so it turns out there are actually uh, three different sets of drivers for this on the Vogons forum. And I tried all three of those, and with one of them I actually had some luck. Uh, now, the viewer question was actually, does it make it run any faster? I mean, can you get a higher speed or a higher frame rate? And the answer to that is no, but... This is what it looks like running with that driver, and as you can see, it's actually worse than the driver that I was using before. Uh, but there is one advantage with this particular driver, and that is that it does get all the way through the 3D Mark 99. Uh, you remember in last week's video, it was actually pausing here and just basically hanging the machine. Uh, so even though this doesn't look right, it does mean that we can get a score for the 3D uh, 99 and that is 312 3D marks. Also, uh, I ran it again with uh, 3D Mark 2000 and I was able to get 925 3D marks. So, of course, this is not a fair comparison, but it'll give us a baseline against which we can compare all our AGP cards this week, most of which I assume will work perfectly with both 3D Mark 99 and 2000. I'm going to go through these cards in batches, so there'll be two batches today, and the first batch has got seven cards in it. Uh, so the first one here is actually a Creative Blaster, uh, so if you want the exact model number it's a CT6710. And this is a Reva TNT card, so uh, it's an NVIDIA chip, uh, I won't say GPU because this is from the very early days of NVIDIA before they got their GeForce series going and so on. Uh, so it's pretty primitive. It's 16 megabytes, 128-bit uh, bandwidth, and it's only a 2 times AGP card. Uh, so the graphics core runs at 90 megahertz, and the memory is 110 megahertz. So this is 1998. Uh, so this is actually the earliest of the cards uh, in this batch, and it's the NV4 chip uh, from NVIDIA. So the next card uh, along here is uh, made by MSI and it's a G4 MX460 and it basically just has a GeForce 4 MX460 chip in it uh, which is again an NVIDIA one and uh, this one's a lot faster. It's first of all four times AGP and it has a 256-bit uh, core and 128-bit memory uh, bandwidth and the core speed is uh, 300 megahertz and the memory bandwidth is 450 megahertz so this is a really fast card and uh, I actually have another GeForce card, it's a GeForce TI 4200 and it's the fastest card that I've actually benchmarked on a Pentium 3 uh, so I'm going to be really interested to see how close this one comes, it's in the same uh, league of course, but uh, the TI should be a little bit faster. Uh, so this is 2002. Uh, now it's actually not the most recent card in the lineup. There's a few others that are, are more recent. Uh, so, but this is the NV17 chipset, and uh, basically 
uh, it should be the fastest card. NVIDIA cards were really, really fast around this time, uh, so it will probably beat out uh, the other ones. So three of the cards, uh, including this one here, are ATI Radeon 9200s. Now, uh, the weird thing about this one, I can't quite read the sticker on the back. It either says 9200SE or 9200LE. And when I look on Wikipedia, it doesn't show those in the list of uh, ATI GPUs. Uh, it just shows the 9200 and the 9200SE. Uh, but if you look on other websites, they have the 9200, the 9200SE, and the 9200LE. Now the LE was clocked faster than the SE, uh, so I can't tell what this is, uh, but it actually seems to be slower than the other 9200 SEs that I have, uh, which doesn't make any sense at all because it's the LE that should be clocked faster. So if anyone uh, has any idea what could cause one of these 9200s to be clocked slower, uh, let me know in the comments. The only thing I'll note about this is I had a look online and I found other you know, cards that are very, very similar to this one, but they have an ATI heatsink on it. So I think that whoever's had this card has replaced the heatsink on it. Anyway, all of these 9200s are basically the same. Uh, they're from 2003. Uh, they use the RV280 chipset and they're 8 times AGP. Uh, so the core speed is 200 megahertz and the memory speed is 166 megahertz or an effective uh, memory speed of 332 megahertz. Uh, the two of the cards are 64 uh, megabytes and one of them is actually 128 megabytes. So I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but otherwise everything else is identical on these. Uh, so I think that these should be a fast card because they're 2003, but as we'll see in the benchmarks, um, you know, they, they don't really uh, come up to the same speed as the NVIDIA cards from the same era. Uh, so the other two 9200s are here, and the uh, 9200 that is 128 megabytes is this gigabyte one. Unfortunately, I had a few problems with that one. There's some wobbling on the screen. Uh, probably there's a dodgy capacitor on this. Um, it's still quite usable, and of course I could get a benchmark without any problems at all, but it's just a shame that the picture looks like it's sort of uh, shimmering or wobbling. Uh, so other than that, those cards are all the same. That's just a 128 meg version. And the next one along is one that I've never seen before, and this is a Rage XL, so it's an ATI card. It's only 8 megabytes, but it's based on the Rage 3 architecture, and it's from, uh, well, it was originally designed in 1998, but uh, this particular card is 99. And it's quite slow, it has a core speed of 125 megahertz and a memory speed of 83 megahertz, uh, and it's just a 64-bit uh, bandwidth and it's also only two times AGP so we certainly don't expect that to be too fast uh, but it's an interesting card for me because I don't have one of these and uh, I'm sure that they're very common but um, you know eventually uh, you encounter one of these for the first time and it's interesting to put it into context with the other cards so the final card there is uh, an ELSA TNT2 M64 uh, CT and I know that uh, the TNT2 M64s have a really bad reputation, uh, but I will point out that it's the first card, you know, chronologically speaking, uh, that actually runs the 2001 uh, 3D Mark benchmark, uh, you know, in this collection here. So for people who didn't have uh, a card with this capability, it was still worth it in the day. It was a very cheap uh, alternative for people who didn't have uh, those capabilities. Uh, so the brand name for this one is a Razer 3. That's just an Elsa uh, name that they gave the card uh, to make it sound special. Um, but it's just a 16 mag box standard TNT2 M64 card. So this is based on the NVIDIA NV6 chipset. 
and it's four times AGP. Uh, but again, the clock speeds are very slow on this, so it's 125 megahertz core. Uh, although the memory uh, speed is actually pretty good at 150 megahertz, uh, so it should beat out the uh, ATI Rage XL by quite a bit, I would imagine. And uh, the memory bandwidth on this is 64 megabytes. So this is 1999. Uh, it's the same as the uh, Rage XL in terms of uh, year. Uh, the Rage XL technically came earlier, uh, but uh, as I said, that uh, particular Rage XL that I've got is actually a 99 card. So they're basically the same year, and uh, but I would expect the, the the TNT2 M64 to perform a little bit better. So let's take a look at the benchmarks for these cards. Let's discuss the 3D Mark 99 results first. Uh, and remember that 3D Mark 99 is running at 800 by 600 with 16-bit uh, color here. And you could have DOS games running at 800 by 600. Uh, and in fact, they'd probably even get a higher frame rate. I think uh, in 3D Mark 99, I was getting about 75 frames per second at the absolute top end here. And you probably have DOS games running at a higher frequency on this Pentium 3 machine. Uh, so uh, there's a real difference though between what's going on in a DOS game where the CPU is doing most of the work and something like this where you have an entire 3D render pipeline implemented in hardware um, and you know generating 3D models and texturing them and so on. Uh, so that's a very different process and I'll talk a little bit about what the difference is between the two approaches uh, in a little later part of the video. Uh, but let's just look at these numbers. So obviously the best card was the uh, MSI MX460 and that's not a surprise given that it's a GeForce 4 card. Um, so I do have a GeForce 4 Ti4200 that I mentioned and it's the best card that I've ever benchmarked on this machine. And actually uh, this card beats it out by one point. Uh, but I'm not going to declare it the winner just yet and the reason for that is that I have a GeForce 2 GTS so two generations prior, which gets 7377 in 3D Mark 99. So it turns out that 3D Mark 99 is actually not very good for comparing uh, the different generations of card. And it's only when you get to 3D Mark 2000 and 2001 that the actual graphics features uh, start to matter a lot more. Uh, in some sense, 3D Mark 99 is kind of, you know, comparing the pixel pushing power of these cards and once you get to a certain level, they all perform, you know, roughly the same, basically. Uh, but there are some interesting things here. So, uh, the first thing is that that Creative Reva TNT card does pretty well. Uh, so that's actually a 1998 card and the ATO Rage XL, well, admittedly it's a 98 chip, uh, but the card itself is 99 and you can see that it performs way worse. Uh, so the, uh, the NVIDIA chip in that creative card uh, is really uh, something special in comparison. And you see a, you know, a little bit of an improvement in the TNT to M64. It, it is a better chip than the TNT uh, for all the bad things that people say about it. Uh, the other interesting thing here is uh, of the three Radeon 9200s in the middle there, remember the Gigabyte is also one of those, uh, the one that I couldn't read uh, the label on, so I think it says SE, but I'm not sure, uh, is substantially slower, uh, even in this benchmark, than uh, the other two Radeon 9200s. And I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, I don't think it's just down to something like thermal paste uh, or, you know, fan or anything like this. Uh, the, the conditions seem to be the, pretty much the same for the cards. Uh, but I do wonder whether there is another kind of 9200 and uh, that's actually slightly different uh, and that I just can't read what it says on the label. Uh, so I'm very interested to find out about that. Again, if you know about that, um, what that could be, then uh, put a comment below. Uh, but other than that, uh, there's not really very much more that we can get from these figures. So let's move on to the 3D Mark 2000 benchmarks. And here they are, the 3D Mark 2000 ones. Now, of course, 3D Mark 2000 runs at 1024768 uh, at 16-bit color. And you can see here that the MSI MX460 is now way ahead of all the other cards. 
And this is a real feature of this benchmark that the later the card, uh, the more uh, distinguished it will be from everything else. Uh, so to give you some other comparisons, my GeForce 4 Ti 4200 uh, scores 98.71 in this benchmark. So it's actually way ahead even the MX460. And another interesting comparison is with an ATI Radeon 9600 and that actually scores 96.23 and of course that's a later card. Uh, but it does show that uh, the more sophisticated the card, uh, the better it will perform in these uh, 3D Mark 2000 and 2001 benchmarks. Uh, the other interesting thing here is just how badly behind the ATI Ra uh, Rage XL and the TNT and TNT2 cards have uh, fallen. Now, uh, that's not necessarily because they're performing any worse, it's really because there's a lot fewer features available. And I'll discuss some of that uh, a little bit later in the video, uh, what's actually missing here. Uh, but you can see that some of the tests don't actually run, uh, and so that gives uh, very, very low scores. Of course, the Rage Excel is also just quite slow. Uh, but, uh, you know, the main thing here is really just the tests not being able to be run due to lack of uh, implemented features. Uh, you can still see that uh, that first yellow ATI Radeon bar there is still lower than the other two. Uh, what's kind of interesting here is that the Gigabyte one actually seems to get uh, a measurable improvement over the uh, more generic ATI Radeon card uh, in the middle there. Uh, so again, uh, maybe it's possible that some of these cards are just clocked differently uh, than the uh, manufacturer's frequencies, and perhaps this uh, El Cheapo ATI Radeon on the left um, is an SE, but just clocked slower. So that's one theory that I have. Uh, but otherwise, you'll see this uh, pattern through all three of the benchmarks. So let's move on to the 3D Mark 2001 benchmarks. And you can see that two of the cards have actually dropped out now, the Reaver TNT and the Rage XL. Uh, this is mainly due to memory, but also just due to the uh, version of DirectX that's required, I think. Uh, you'll notice that the TNT2 M64, even though it's only a 16 meg card, actually does run this benchmark. Uh, it does it very, very poorly, and most of the tests don't actually run, but it will get through. Um, now the 3D Mark 2001 is still 1024 by 768 but it's now 32-bit color so that does push the memory requirements up at least. Uh, now to my eye the MX460 doesn't look that much further ahead of the other cards anymore and uh, it's not really clear why that is uh, but to give you a comparison my GeForce 4 Ti 4200 uh, which is still a GeForce 4 card uh, gets 7,504 points in this benchmark. So I don't know whether this benchmark it may be just weighted to give cards that are just that little bit faster uh, a much higher score, or whether it really is that much better. But uh, certainly it remains uh, the fastest card that I've benchmarked on this machine. Um, actually, the ATI Radeon 9600 uh, gets 7,523, which is actually a little bit faster than my TI 4200, but um, you know, it's, it depends on which benchmark you're running, and I still consider the GeForce 4 Ti 4200 to be the fastest that I've run. I think I said earlier that the Radeon 9600 is a much later card. It's actually only 2003, which uh, technically all of those uh, 9200s are also uh, 2003. Uh, so uh, they're sort of in the same, uh, similar generation, uh, but it is a much, much better card and you know it does actually compete very very well with the GeForce 4. Anyway of the ones that are here there's not very much to say. Uh, we see the same uh, slope going from the 9200 that I can't identify through to the Gigabyte one at the top. Uh, here again you can see that it's just that little bit better uh, so I'm just assuming that it's clocked at slightly higher frequencies maybe a small factory overclock and uh, other than that there's really nothing more to say here. So I'm going to go back now and uh, talk a little bit more about some of the features of these cards that I didn't discuss when I went through uh, originally. And maybe that'll explain some of the differences that you get in these uh, benchmarks more clearly. Now 3D cards are quite different to 2D cards. I mean the 2D ones are just basically pixel pipes. They have 
uh, block of memory in which you store color information. Uh, but the 3D cards start with a 3D model or multiple 3D models making up a scene. And uh, when I say 3D card here, I don't just mean the hardware, I also mean the drivers and the OpenGL or DirectX interfaces that allow, you know, using those cards. So all together I'll call that a 3D card. And so you start off with a bunch of 3D models which are essentially just polygons. And then on those polygons you paint textures. So for example, if you had a table in a scene, uh, that would be a 3D object which would be modelled giving a bunch of vertices, one for each of the corners of the table. Uh, you know, of each of the parts of the table, and then on each of the faces of that table, you'd have some texture overlaid. So if it was a wood table, you might have a wood grain bitmap image, and you would wrap that around the table object. And then on top of that, you're going to have various effects. For example, uh, you might have some bump mapping, which is uh, where you have a sort of uh, bumpy appearance to the object or you might have lighting effects, uh, specular reflections, and so on. Uh, and then at the end of all of that, uh, it has to uh, output screen pixels. So it has to take the 3D information from that 3D model uh, with all the textures painted on it and then convert that into uh, screen pixels. So that's a process called rasterization, uh, basically named after the rasters that uh, make up uh, a television screen. Now the render pipeline is usually broken down into four components, at least in this era, and you'll often see these uh, four numbers uh, for pixel shaders, vertex shaders, texture mapping units, or TMUs, and raster operations pipelines, uh, or ROPs. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, render output units. Uh, so for example, the MX460 has uh, two pixel shaders, no vertex shaders, four TMUs, and two ROPs. Uh, so what do these numbers actually mean, and how does that translate to a render pipeline? And the reason I want to go through that is because, in comparison, my GeForce 4 TI4200, which I've been talking so much about, has basically double the specs uh, if you go through each of those different kinds of units. Uh, so it's 4284 4 instead of 2042. And notice that it has two vertex shaders, whereas the other GeForce 4, the MX460, has zero vertex shaders. Now, the 3 d Mark 2001 benchmark has vertex shader benchmarks in it. And so this probably explains uh, almost single-handedly why uh, the GeForce 4 TI4200 is able to get a 50% better score in that benchmark. Uh, but what are each of these units for, and what do these actually mean? So I want to go through those now. The first of these is the pixel shader, and uh, these deal with individual pixels. So they could be pixels on the screen, or, or even just pixels within a texture that you're going to overlay onto your objects. And you might want to do some uh, modification. You don't just want to paint uh, the scene with bland information. You might want to add some additional things like bump mapping, for example, where you have a kind of texture on top of your uh, object to make it look like it's raised in various parts. Um, or you might want to have shadows cast on your object, or maybe there are specular highlights due to some lighting. Uh, and sometimes you want to take uh, multiple images and overlay them on top of each other, and one of them will show through more than the other, so that's translucency. Uh, so basically, uh, a pixel shader allows you to, uh, you know, have a very sophisticated array of effects that can be applied to textures and to the screen itself. Uh, the other thing that pixel shaders have to deal with is the depth uh, of the pixels. Uh, so obviously, a screen uh, or even a, just a texture is just a two-dimensional thing, uh, but the objects you're trying to portray are three-dimensional, so they have a a notional depth or distance from the viewer, and this is called the Z uh, value uh, for you know X, Y, and Z coordinates. And so you have to store that information somewhere. So a Z buffer is basically a 2D array, uh, one for each pixel, uh, but uh, it contains uh, the value of the Z coordinate or the depth. And so obviously if you have two objects and one of them is in front of the other, it's going to have a closer Z value 
And so you'll know uh, if you've got something in the Z buffer already and you put some other object in your scene, uh, you'll know if it has a closer Z value at that particular pixel that it's actually in front. And so you can just ignore the one behind, you don't have to render that. Uh, so a Z buffer is just basically a trick uh, for enabling that. But pixel shaders have to deal with this uh, Z information as well. Now just as the pixel shaders are basically 2D because they're just dealing with uh, screen pixels or texture pixels, uh, vertex shaders are 3D uh, units in the rendering pipeline. Uh, so they're dealing with the actual vertices of objects and their basic function is to take the 3D coordinates uh, that that object has and convert them into 2D coordinates, so in other words, a position on the screen, if you like, uh, and a Z information, so to, you know, to fill the Z buffer. Uh, so the, the other thing that they can handle is uh, texture coordinates. So if you think about a polygon, which needs to have a texture laid on it, uh, you want to know where exactly uh, that texture should be laid down. So you're not necessarily going to start right from the very corner of the texture all the time. Uh, you might want it to start at a different position within the texture uh, because, for example, you might be wrapping that texture around the object. Uh, so when you get to a certain uh, face of the object, uh, you're going to need a specific portion of that uh, texture to be wrapped over that face. Uh, and so it'll deal with uh, all of that sort of thing. The other thing that they can do is uh, per vertex uh, lighting and so on, but that's a little bit more advanced and I'm not going to go into details about that, uh, mainly because I'm not an expert in this stuff myself. Well, we've already talked about 2D and 3D, so what's actually left? Uh, well, there is uh, the texture mapping units, and these basically place uh, bitmaps, the textures, onto the 3D model. So just knowing the coordinates uh, within the texture is not enough uh, to actually lay the texture down. Uh, so in particular, the texture mapping unit can do a bunch of different stuff. So it can rotate uh, the images, it can resize them, you know, they might not be the right size for the object that you want to put them onto, and it can apply a variety of different distortions as well. So I would say these are effects uh, so the texture mapping unit is really in charge of actually taking uh, the texture bitmap, uh, making sure it's in the right orientation uh, for the model that you want to lay it on, and then actually doing that job. And the final unit is the raster operations pipeline, or ROP. And this is doing rasterization. So this is the thing that actually generates all the actual pixel colors that end up on the screen. Uh, so it'll take pixel information and texture pixels, or texels, uh, and it'll combine those together uh, to give the final pixel color for the screen. Uh, so one of the things that these do uh, is anti-aliasing. Uh, so you might not want to just compute uh, which pixel within a texture you want to take, and then take that, that uh, pixel. Uh, for example, if you had a black pixel at that point, and it was completely surrounded by orange pixels, all of which don't appear on the screen, uh, then you're going to end up with a sort of artifacts which look uh, really odd. Uh, so instead what it'll do is it'll take an average over that black pixel uh, in, the, in the texture and all of the orange ones surrounding it, and it'll get a slightly darker orange uh, instead of black and use that as the color for the screen pixel. And that's called anti-aliasing. It just sort of smooths things out so that uh, you don't just get sudden jumps in color just because you happen to land on a pixel of a given color within your texture. Uh, so the raster operations pipeline is really the last thing that gets done. Uh, it's the thing that computes what you actually see on the screen after combining all the information that's come from uh, all of the other units in the pipeline. Uh, so that's a, a you know, bird's eye view of what goes on. As I said, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, and in any case, it's all very much abstracted by uh, the layers between the hardware, uh, the driver, uh, which will often break more complicated things down into a lot of smaller things that the card can actually handle, and the interface through OpenGL or DirectX or S3D or whatever other, uh, you know, 
API the programmer is using. Uh, so it's a fairly complicated system and a lot of that complexity is hidden uh, from you as a user. So this is uh, some kind of an abstract view of what's going on. Uh, but these uh, elements actually exist within uh, the hardware themselves. Uh, these pixel shaders, vertex shaders, uh, ROPs and TMUs. And so that explains some of the differences that we're getting between the various cars, even if they might run at a similar frequency and have uh, similar amounts of memory. Well, I hadn't realized that this video had already started to get quite so long. It looks like it's up to nearly 30 minutes, and I haven't even put in the footage for the second batch of cards yet. Uh, there's some really interesting cards in there, and I have finished benchmarking them, except for one, uh, which is really interesting, but I haven't been able to get it to work under Windows 98. Uh, so I'm going to hold that uh, batch over for a later video, and uh, perhaps I can get that card to work in the meantime. I'm not too confident about that. Uh, but it'd be really great if I did manage it. Uh, so that's all I really have time for for this week. And uh, so hopefully you'll join me again for the next uh, iteration of these AGP cards. And uh, so we'll see you in a later video. Bye.